Okay, and we are continuing on our message from last week on moving forward. As you know, this is the theme for 2022, and that's what we need to do this year. We need to move forward in our life. We need to have some forward progress. And in reality, guys, as we talked and discussed last week, there are three things that we know we need to be able to move forward, and that is the past, and that are problems, and also sometimes uh, it is people. It is people. We understand that uh, the principle of moving forward means forward progress. The principle of moving forward means that we need to have some type of inertia, some type of energy that has taken us from one point to another. But as we look in Hebrews in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about, with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, we do come before you again, and we ask you to move in a mighty way this morning. We ask for a special blessing upon the reading of your word and the preaching from this text today. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus Christ's name we ask. Amen. So, beloved, as we mentioned last week, uh, to continue uh, to, to, again, look at this theme for 2022 of moving forward, we clearly understand that life is a race. We know that it is a race. And, and with any race, there is a starting point and there is a finishing point. But it is the movement that we are particularly focusing on today, the movement in the middle of the start and the finish line that we need to be concerned with in our life today. There is a race that we understand that is a race of life. A race of life consists of the day that you were born and the day that you die, but that which happens in the middle will define, uh, will define your life, will define your, trust, your testimony. There, are, there is a race in relationships, if you will. And no matter who you are, no matter where you are, uh, the, minute you, the minute you begin that relationship, that race begins. And the day that you end that relationship is the day that it ends. That's the finish line, if you will. And what happens between the start and the finish of that relationship is really and truly what determines the memories thereof. But beloved, we need to understand, as we mentioned last week, there is a race in the Christian life, and no matter how, uh, how you are, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, the minute you give your heart over to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you by faith accept the free gift of salvation paid for and offered through the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is when you enter the Christian race. Your, your human race, your, your race in this life begins on the day that you were born, born. It ends the day that you die. Again, as mentioned before, the, the life of a relationship or the race of a relationship begins when it, when it begins and when it is finished, those two different things. Now, many of those things can coincide one with another. But as for the Christian race, the race that Paul is referring to here in Hebrews chapter 12, my friend, we understand that it begins on the day you were saved, the day that you were born again. And this race is not a sprint. It is not a stroll through the park, but rather it is a marathon, if you will, a marathon that, that is driving us, some may say drawing us through the force of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is sat at the right hand of the throne of God at the finish line, I may add, because he's already completed his race, and yet he is the author and finisher of of our faith. Now, my friend, running has many different variables to consider. Some are physical, others are mental, and even some are emotional. But make no mistake, the Christian race is a spiritual one, which ties into both physical, mental, and emotional. The components of fitness, beloved, we understand, uh, they include cardiorespiratory endurance, which relies on, on proper function of your heart, your lungs, your blood vessels to transport oxygen to your tissues and carry away metabolic waste products. That we understand. The, the, other, the, the second component of fitness is muscular strength. Muscular strength refers to the maximum amount of force a muscle can produce at one time. It's also referred to as repetition maximum. And then there is muscular endurance, guys, which is the ability of a muscle to resist fatigue while exerting a submaximal amount of force. Essentially, it is the measure of how long a muscle can withstand prolonged contraction or many repeated contractions. Then there's flexibility, the ability of your, of your joints to move within a certain range of motion. And the final component 
to fitness, my friend, is body composition. It refers to the ratio of fat mass and fat-free mass, such as muscle bones and organs and, 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 and water that is inside of our body. That's what they refer to. Now, all of these components that I mentioned to you right now, they're all associated with running. They are all physical that we've spoke about, but there are also something known as the six components of motor skills related to fitness, and they are agility, balance, coordination, power, reaction time, and speed. Now, you, be sad, you may be sat here this morning going, what on earth does that have to do with Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2? What on earth does that have to do with the Christian race? Even though the Christian race is a marathon and not a sprint, these components of fitness that I just mentioned, as well as these motor skills, they relate to the spiritual in the same manner. Endurance, strength, flexibility, body composition, uh, you know, all, have, all play a role in how we run our Christian race on the spiritual level. Some on the mental, some on the emotional, and yes, some on the physical. Again, we looked at the really the body composition last week. You can, you can link uh, that fat mass, if you will, in relation to non-fat mass of your body comparative to those weights and sins that we spoke about last week and being able to move forward. You're not going to be able to move forward efficiently. You're not going to be able to move forward uh, fluently, if you will. You're not going to be able to move forward and do it without running poorly if you're carrying around the weights of the past and weights of problems and even the weights of other people in your life, the weights and sin that do so easily beset our race. So even though these components, both physical and spiritual, are key to the effectiveness of our running, Guys, we must remember, outside of the obvious components of spiritual fitness, there are points of performance that we must become efficient in in order to run well in our Christian race, in order to move forward, in order to be moving forward into this year, into this week, into this month, into this day, and into the hours to come. There are certain points of performance that we need to understand. Beloved, this race in our life, I want you to make it very crystal clear this morning. This race will not be muscled by mine or your own personal strength. One of the things that people will do when they get in the midst of sin, when, and I've seen this amongst, I've seen it amongst preachers, I've seen it amongst uh, men uh, in, in the business world, I've seen it everywhere there is. When, when, when they fall into sin, you start to notice that they're, they start muscling their preaching. They start relying on their certain talents, and maybe they have a talent to sing, and they'll, they'll burst out in a song in the middle of the sermon just to kind of lure the people and play on the emotions. All the while, uh, their, their heart is sinfully darkened by what that which they've done the night or the day day before. My friend, I'm going to tell you right now, the Christian race will not be muscled by your talents. It will not be muscled by your treasure. It will not be muscled by that which you can do in and of yourself. But rather, this Christian race will be moved by the strength of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said this, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. There's the key. For when I am weak, then am I strong. My friend, you can take pleasure in your infirmities as you brought it on yourself, and it's not going to do you one bit of good in the spiritual race. You can take pleasure, pleasure, if you will, in the reproaches that man brings against you because of your own stupid choices or your own uh, you know, contradictory attitude. Guys, that is not going to benefit the cause of Christ in one bit. It's not going to move you forward in the Christian race. Persecutions that you bring on yourself because you said the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong people. Guys, I'm telling you, that's not going to benefit the Christian race. But the things that are brought upon you, the infirmities, reproaches, necessities, the persecutions, the distress, for Christ's sake, that's when Paul says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So, beloved, when you get your strength, consistency. Where you get your strength, your consistency, your fortitude, your drive, your trust, your dependence, your hope, you name it today, will continue to be a driving force in the Christian race. Guys, wherever these things are coming from, again, I say them again, your strength, consistency, fortitude, drive, trust, dependency, you hope, you name it, point number one will always be your line of sight. All that's where you get your strength today, your consistency, your fortitude will always be in your line of sight. In verse 2 of chapter Hebrews, uh, chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews, the first three words, looking unto Jesus. What is in your line of sight, guys, is where your focus will remain for your attention. What you're looking at in these days, where, where your attention is focused. I mean, my soul, 
We've read verse after verse after verse. You know, let your affections be on, on the things of heaven. Let your affections be on the things that are eternal. Let your heart be focused on that which Christ has said and what Christ will do and who, who Christ is and what he has done in our life and what he has done for us. In this Christian race today, your line of sight needs to be on the one that has already finished it, the author and finisher of our faith. It needs to be at the one that is at the end of the race right now, sat at the right hand of the throne of God. In this race, guys, may I say this to you this morning, there will be distractions. Our life is filled with distractions. The daily news has become one of the, one of the largest distractions, I believe, from reality that we deal with in our world today. Our world is beaten down, and they are so afraid to do anything in this world today because of something that come out on the news. Now, guys, I understand there's a lot of real news that are on the news today, but we live in a world today, we live in a society today that is not interested in getting on the news what is right, but really they want to get it on there first. And any retractions or any, any, any correction or anything like that, it's never going to be on the breaking news. It's going to be on the back page somewhere, you know, page 14 in the lower right-hand column. You're not going to hear it. We live in a world uh, that, much like the world of the Athenians. As Paul said in Acts 17, he said that uh, the, the Athenians, they, they, they gave their life to telling or hearing something new. That's what news has become today. And beloved people today are living in, with higher stresses, higher anxieties, dysfunctions, more than any other uh, generation beforehand. And here's the sad part. Here's the caveat about that. Our generation today has more conveniences, more comfort than anyone that's ever come before us again. Anyone whatsoever. We have more ability, to, we, have, we have the ability to collect more information in the matter of seconds than what men and women could have done a hundred years ago. Men used to have to sit down and they used to have to read through 30, 40, 50 chapters of the Word of God to find one verse that they know that was there, but they just didn't quite know exactly where it was. And then the crossroad, not today. What do we do today? Where's that verse that says such and such? Well, we get on there and we Google it. We open up our Bible app. We look for the, the word that we can remember, and boom, there it is. That's the world we live in. We live in a world of convenience, and yet we have children growing up, three and four years old, complaining about anxieties today. I mean, I'm not being callous, guys. I'm not being hardcore on this, and I'm not saying it's fake, although I want to. I'm going to be honest with you. I want to say it is. I think they're just repeating what they've been told. They've been, they're repeating what they've been labeled as is what it is. I think parents need to get off of their ever-widening horizon and raise their children. It's not the government's job or the school's job to raise your children. You had them, you raise them, amen? That's what I believe today. And I believe that the anxieties that they're dealing with, the stress, is coming from the above. Hey, listen, everything rises and falls on leadership. One of the reasons when my kids were growing up, when they were young, one of the reasons I didn't lose control in front of them, one of the reasons I didn't start yelling at them and flip out and all this and that when they did something wrong was because if they saw me out of control, they're not focused on what mistake or what wrong thing they've done. They focused on how out of control daddy is. And if daddy, the head of the house, the protector and provider of the home, if I'm out of control, the insecurity is set into their life. No show dads in our world today has produced children with a higher stress level, high anxieties, high insecurities, and they don't know where to go. The Bible tells us that a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Understand that, guys. We live in a world today filled with distractions. And beloved, you cannot win a race, guys. You cannot win a race today. You can't win a match. You can't win a game. You cannot win a competition when you are looking everywhere than where you should be in order to move forward. Your line of sight must be focused on the one who has already finished. And this is when those components of fitness come into play. When distractions begin to hit us, it is our muscular strength. Mind you, it is our spiritual strength, if you will, that we draw from the Word of God, the preaching and teaching of the true Word of God, and not the rubbish that's in the world today. Guys, that's, where our spirit, that's why people are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. My goodness, Paul made it clear being tossed to and fro. There, when things are contrary one to another, people don't know where to go. That's a distraction in the race that God has given us. So our muscular strength today, our spiritual strength, if you will, that, 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 uh, that component of fitness, spiritually speaking today, comes into play. Our endurance. Anybody can do something for a short time. 
You can attend church every Sunday for a short period of time. You can read your Bible for a short period of time. People can be consistent in prayer. People can give biblically and accurately for a short period of time. But it's going to take spiritual endurance. It's going to take you working the problem, amen, to continue to do that for the rest of your life. Our flexibility are, is going to come into play. Are we able to bend and move when and where we, are, we need to in this race when distractions come in our way? Beloved, the six motor skills, the six components of motor skills comes into play in our Christian life, spiritually speaking. Agility, we've got to be able to move, guys. Our balance, our coordination, our power, our reaction time, and our speed in the midst of this race all plays a part in the Christian race if you're going to move forward today. In the midst of distractions, when a distraction is coming this way, we've got to have the agility to, to sidestep and to keep moving forward. We've got to have the speed to throw it off, off kilter and continue to move forward. We've got to be able to do that in our Christian life today. It has nothing to do with our physical capabilities, but it has everything to do with where our line of sight is, who and what we are focused on, and the purpose of doing this. Guys, in this race, there are going to be distractions. Secondly, in this race, there are going to be downturns. Downturns. Beloved, a downturn is defined as a decline in economic business or other activity. And my friend, let's be honest, life has plenty of them. They are always, always present. They are typically, they typically come infrequently, if you want to be honest. But nonetheless, they're going to happen. In order to be moving forward in the Christian life, your line of sight must be focused on the one who has already finished. I've already said that, and I'll say that multiple times this morning. When downturns occur in our life, that is the time we are to dig in. Exercise those principles of, uh, of components within our spiritual fitness. Get our strength, endurance, our flexibility where it needs to be. Utilize those six motor skills with our agility, balance, coordination, power, reaction time, and speed. And guys, some are going to be used more than others, but we must adapt and move forward when downturns happen. You, you may say, well, well spirit, preacher, in a spiritual world, what do you consider a downturn? individually in our Christian life. We all have ups and downs. Guys, you're not going to live on the high mountain all the time. That's one of the problems with some of the false teachings we find in our world today, that they think that you need to be up and screaming and yelling and hooping and hollering and all of these good times, happy clappy, I've heard it said over here, happy clappy all the time. That's not life, amen? That's what, the, that's what Big Pharma wants to do to us. Big Pharma wants to pump us full of pills today so that we live a life like this right here. So we have no, emotion, no emotional up downs or, or downturns. You need those in your life, amen. You need the downturns that come in so that you can appreciate the high moments. But remember this, the high moment, the, the, the mountaintop experience, the times you were shouting out when all things are running like you were. You were. Guys, you're going to get to another high point in your life. But a mountain, two mountains are always made up of a valley, and that's a downturn that's going to be in your life, a decline in activity, a decline of something that's happened in your days. Sometimes it's just a winter season in your own spiritual life, but that is when you dig in. That is when your trust and your dependence and your focus on the finish line becomes ever so much greater. You dig into what has been proven. You dig into what you have you found your trust in, your dependence. You dig into where you, are. you find your fortitude, your drive, your energy. Hey, listen, that's when you dig in like none other. Oh, Churchill said, if I can get the quote correctly, Churchill said, success is going from failure to failure with the same enthusiasm. One of my favorite quotes of all time. Success is going from failure to failure with the same enthusiasm. That's a downturn, my friend. And they're going to happen in your Christian life. They're going to happen in the Christian race. And it's just going to be simply time for you to dig in, move forward. Thirdly, under our line of sight, my friend, in this race, there will be darkness. There will be. Life is not always unicorn and rainbows, guys. Life is not always candy floss and happy days and happy times. There are going to be minutes, sometimes hours, and even days, or even months of darkness in our life. There are times when the darkness seems to wrap around the depths of our soul. And it is these times, these moments, these hours when the light cannot be seen but we must remain at a steady pace, lock into position, continue to move forward. And beloved, even when you cannot see the light, the light is there. When you can't see the light, my friend, it is your turn and your time to be the light. Jesus Christ said this, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. 
and even and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light uh, so shine before men that they are they are that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know the you know the best part about that verse this morning. Because it is so anti-mankind. It is anti-flesh. It is anti-carnality. It is anti-what our human nature strives for. You know, Jesus said that they, may see, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven, not you. Amen? We tend to want to do good works and say, hey, look at me, look at me, look what I do. Everybody see? Jesus says, no, 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 no. You be the light in the midst of darkness, and they'll glorify the Father. You know what I want people to see in me? When those dark times and those distractions and those downturns come into my life, I want people to see me pressing on, adapt and overcome, adapt and move forward, continue to move forward in my life, despite what may be going on around me, not for them to say, boy, I tell you, BJ sure is a man. That's not what I want them to say. I want them to say, man, he's got something different about him. Something's different about him that it ain't made up in human. You know what? And it's not. It's something supernatural. What is it? It's my Father in heaven who I've received the Holy Spirit of God through him, by him, by the precious gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I want people to see, amen. And my friend, if you'll press forward, if you will be moving forward in this life, if you'll move forward in this Christian race, despite the distractions, downturn, and the darkness that come into your days, you dig in, amen. People will glorify Jesus Christ, and that's what we want them to do. Beloved, when our eyes, where our eyes go, and for your sports enthusiasts out there, you know this. Where our eyes go, our head follows. Where our head moves, the body, the body will follow suit. Our line of sight is the key to forward progress. Whether it be an athletic competition, whether it be a business development, family initiatives, but especially in the Christian race that God has given us in this world today, the line of sight is the key. It plays a vital role in moving forward. Secondly, our line of sight must be focused on the Lord our Savior. On the Lord our Savior. Look there in verse 2 with me again. It says, looking unto Jesus. That's our line of sight. Our Lord our Savior says unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know, what, you know what I like about that? He, you know, Jesus says in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He goes on and on and on. I'm the first and the last. I'm this, I'm that. But right here we find in Hebrews 12 that he is the author, right? And he's the finisher of our faith. And my friend, the beautiful part of this is that, 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 that chapter 12 opens up with these words. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Okay, and we talked about this last week just a little bit. But I want to dig a little bit deeper on it this morning to give you the encouragement so that you may know that you can finish the race that God has given you in this world today. Because he sat, Jesus Christ has sat at the finish line. He is the author. He is the finisher. He's the one to put you in the race. But he's also given us a testimony on the front end of that. He's given us witnesses on the front end of that. The witnesses that he's referring to are the litany of recorded events in chapter 11. The hall of faith that we refer to that chapter. Events that are recorded like, uh, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as of yet, as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. I'll stop there just for a second. Mind you guys, for 1996 years, of the created world, it had never rained one time. Remember, the, the, the earth received its, its, uh, its nutrients of water from the earth, from the sea that was beneath, right? The deep broke up, waters came up during the flood, and the canopy that was around the earth, it dropped. That's one of the reasons life expectancy began to decrease, because now there was not a protection, as it were, in the first 1,996 years of mankind. So I'm saying all that to say this. It never had rain. And for 120 years, Noah was preaching on something that no one had ever seen about or even knew about. There wasn't a dictionary that could go look and say, what does the word rain mean? Amen. He's building a boat to protect people from a flood. They had no idea what a boat, a flood, or anything was. What are you talking about? Crazy man. Guys, for the last 2,000 years, men have preached 
on something that has yet to happen, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're in this world today. We know the first advent came, but Jesus Christ hadn't descended in the air yet to call his church home. And I believe it's right around the corner. I believe it's right around, I just believe it's right around the corner today. Noah being warned of God of things not yet not seen. He moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. We see by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obey. Why do I mention all of those things? Abel did not have a book to refer to in the Bible like we had. He just offered up to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Enoch was translated. He just lived a righteous life before God and became a picture of the church being raptured out. He was translated. He did not die. Noah, we've already discussed. Abraham Abraham was a Gentile at the first, named Abram, living in Haran, minding his own business, tended to his sheep, doing what he did every single day. And then all of a sudden, a voice he had never heard before said, get on out of this land. Get away from your folks. Get away from your family. I'm going to show you a land that your seed is going to re- uh, receive. And he became a sojourner for the rest of his days, trusted in what the God had said, and had yet to receive that promised land. The last verses of the chapter state this right here, and I'll begin in verse 32. It says, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson, of Jephthah, and of David also, and Samuel, and all the, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, uh, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to, uh, to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, listen carefully, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. I want you to think about it. We have the testimonies of those who have gone before us. Those who have experienced and witnessed and suffered 10,000 times more than we ever have. Yet they ran the race trusting by faith in the word of God, the word that God gave them. And yet none of them saw the Messiah. None of them received the gospel as we have. They heard it when Jesus Christ died, when he went and preached unto men. They received it when they were taken up captivity, when Christ took captivity captive and, and took them up to, uh, to heaven out of paradise. We understand that. But my friend, they lived their life having never seen the author and finisher of our faith who has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And yet they still won the race. They still ran. Guys, what am I saying here? What I'm saying is, if we keep our eyes on the one who's already finished, they didn't have someone to look at who had already finished. They didn't have Jesus Christ who had came and ran his race and finished his course and he sat down on the right hand of the Father and he's saying, come on, man. But they continue to run by faith. And they become a witness and an encouragement for us today in the life that we live and the life that God has granted us and given us. Guys, so that we can still keep our line of sight looking to the Savior. They were moving forward, my friend, and gives us a witness today that we can do the same. So what excuse do we have? We are given a free gift. And yes, there's still going to be distractions and downturns and darkness, But there is still one at the finish line, the Lord our Savior, who gives us an example of what it is to be like, last point this morning, to be locked on success. You notice there in verse 2, it says, joy, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. 
My friend, out of all the thousands of, of testimonies that we find throughout the Word of God of by faith this man, by faith this woman, by faith this child, continued their life and lived that righteous life. And even just the ones that are recorded in Hebrews chapter 11, there was a greater one that was locked onto his success. And he knew, guys, that there was joy that was set before him, even though he had to endure the shame of the cross and the pain of the cross and the separation from the Father and the darkness upon this world. He knew there was joy on the other side. My friend, there was joy set before Christ. He suffered incredibly, unfathomable pain. Physically, emotionally, mentally, he suffered it all. But he was willing to endure the cross solely because of the joy that was set before him. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. My friend, this joy, this joy that Christ had on the other side of the cross that he knew that was there, that he was willing to suffer a, a horrible death such as the crucifixion, a, a terrible pain and agony such as the scourging, humiliation in the, in the carrying of that cross beam to the day of the cross to the place called Golgotha. The fact that God the Father had to turn his back upon him and darkness fell upon the land for three, day, or three hours. He, was in, he, was, he, was, he, he endured that cross. He was willing to go through it because of the joy was the reconciliation of mankind to the Creator, who is Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 17 tells us, who is the image of the invisible God, that's Jesus Christ, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things, watch this, and by Him all things consist beloved the molecular structure of your body today is only held together by jesus christ the creator the, the fabric of this world the the binding and the bonds of this building every man hey listen men and women can do anything they want to do today and they believe their technology is greater and they become a god unto themselves and they idol they worship what they think they're they're creating yet they're creating nothing they're only inventing things through substances that have already been created by jesus and they only can exist because he allows it since the very beginning of mankind, since the very beginning of time, there was not a joy set before the Lord more than this. From the moment that Adam took of that fruit, from the moment that sin entered into mankind, there was no greater joy than the joy that was set before Jesus Christ in reconciling the world. Beloved, did it come at a high price? It most certainly did. Of course it did. Jesus Christ was locked on success. Why was he locked on to success? Because Jesus Christ was moving forward. He knew what was needed in order for the joy to become a reality, in order for mankind to have the opportunity for their sins to be cleansed and life everlasting be given. So, beloved, I ask you this question this morning. How willing are you today to do whatever is needed to run the race that Christ has given you, the race that you got into in the moment that you were saved, the second you accepted the free gift of eternal life, you got into that race. How willing are you today to do is what is needed to be done to be able to move forward, to shed the weight of the past and the problems and even people that may be in our lives, setting our line aside upon the Lord our Savior to be locked on success and simply be moving forward. Beloved, let me encourage you with this, and we're finished. Let us dig in. Let us dig deep, and let's get it done. Will you bow your heads this morning? Father in heaven, I love you, and I thank you for who you are and all that you've done. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, Father, to, to preach your word, and I pray that you, with all your glory and all your power and all of your might, would tender and touch the hearts and the minds and the souls of everyone that has heard this this morning. All of those who may hear it in another venue somewhere else, Lord, I pray 
that you would see the effectiveness of your word, dear God, in their life. That they would choose to run this race that you have placed them in through salvation. That they would run it effectively. Utilizing all the points of performance, Father. Focusing on the components of fitness in the spiritual realm so they may have emotional, mental, definitely spiritual, and even physical benefits in the life that you've thus given us. So, Lord, go with us now. Bless the rest of this day. Be with us tonight as we meet again in Cardiff. And Lord, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Thank you, dear God, for your perfect, preserved, pure word of God. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for joining us today. I do hope and pray the sermon you just heard was a tender blessing to your heart and to your soul. I hope that it gives you the encouragement, edification, to face the challenges that we see each and every day and week throughout our life. I'd like to invite you out to one of our live services here at Saren Chapel in Aberamon. We are located on Lewis Street as well as Davis Street. Davis Street is the entrance to our chapel and as well as Lewis Street is the entrance to our hall and you can use either one of them. But secondly today, guys, I would like to share just a brief message to you now to ask you to where you are going in eternity. If today was the last day you were alive, if today by some tragedy, this was the last moment you had on this earth, when you closed your eyes, would you wake up and see Jesus Christ? It is a simple question, guys, and it is even a more simple answer. The Bible tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, paid the ultimate price for mankind. He gave us the free pass to eternal life by giving his life on the cross of Calvary, being buried into that grave, but rising again on the third day. It is simple as this. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You see, guys, while we were sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ loves us so much that he gave his life. As a matter of fact, Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sin is defined as the transgression of God's law. But what happened was the payment with, for mankind is death. Romans 6.23 clearly tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I ask you today, what would, what would stop you right here, right now, from bowing your head and saying a prayer much like this, Lord Jesus Christ, I trust in you. Jesus Christ, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe that you stepped up out of the grave to give us victory over sin and victory over death. I invite you into my heart and ask forgiveness of my sins and ask you to lead God and direct me throughout the rest of my life. Now, here's the thing. You say that prayer in your own words, but you have to say it and believe in it. Remember, Romans 10, 9 says, And believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That is a promise from the word of God. That is a promise from God himself. That is the promise from the creator of all things, that if you'll believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, ask forgiveness of your sins, accept his free gift and pardon of sin into your heart today, that you will be born again, that you will have eternal life in heaven. Guys, I hope and pray this is a blessing to you today. I hope and pray that you make that decision. And if you have, if you've made that decision today, let us rejoice with you. Come by and see us here at the church or hit us up online at any of the social media outlets or through email or however you can. Just share with us the glorious transformation that you just received in your life. Guys, I hope to see you soon in the house of God. I hope to see you soon right here in Sharon Chapel. And may the Lord be with each and every one of you. God bless.